Hey, I'm starting a new series that uh, Pastor Tim and Ian Miller will be joining with me called uh, Changing the Climate. And uh, we want to change the climate of our church in 2016. Yeah. It's been good in 2015, but we kind of want to lift the thermostat up a little bit. We want to see some changes to take place. And the, the very first message is about heart transformation and uh, what it means to be transformed in our hearts and the best way I can describe it based on the story that I want to share with you, to be transformed in your heart spiritually means you just want to run after Jesus and, uh, and get as much from him and get connected to him and centered around him as possible. You know, heart attitudes are infectious and a small minority of people, just a small group of people can engender a prevailing mindset in a community a town, a region, a church. Groupthink, as the uh, psychologists say, can easily occur among any group of people. And it only takes one or two or three or a really small group of individuals to change the collective thinking pattern and emotional state of a large group. And there's examples in the Bible on this as well as in human history. One of the examples is in the city of Ephesus. Uh, on, the, on the coast of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Kath and I went there the uh, year before last, and uh, amazing, all the ruins, to see where Paul planted that church. It was probably the third largest city of the Roman Empire. And uh, the Apostle Paul was there for nearly three years, but there was an incident that took place where he nearly got lynched by a maddened crowd. And the Scripture says this, let me read it to you. When they heard this, this is the people, they were furious and began shouting. And what they heard was a lie. Just pure lie, a fabrication that some people came up with and that they were actually silversmiths. They were people that were kind of working and creating idol, idols of Diana or Artemis. Um, and so they felt their economic kind of interests were being affected because too many people were getting saved and therefore the idols in their hearts, the, the idolatry in their hearts was broken as Jesus came to live within, so they wouldn't buy the idols of Artemis, the fertility goddess which the city was known for. So it only took two or three people, a group of them, they had a stop work meeting, and, uh, and then they fired up others. They came up with a lie that Paul was out to wreck their economic interests. And so when they heard this, the, they were furious and began shouting. This is the pe people, crowd. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city, get this, the whole city was in an uproar. Hundreds of thousands of people. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's travelling companions from Macedonia, northern Greece, and all of them rushed into the theatre together. Kath and I have been in that theatre. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him, don't go into the theatre. Have a look at this. The scripture. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. That's what I call groupthink. One or two or three people that can inflame a group of people to do unbelievable things, murderous things in the extreme. Hey, it happened to Jesus. It happened to Jesus in his hometown. 30 years he's brought up in Nazareth. Everybody knows Nazareth is not a big place. Everybody knows Joseph and Mary's son, the carpenter. So Jesus continued the carpentry work of Joseph, his, uh, his earthly dad, when his dad died. And at 30 years of age, he gets caught into ministry, gets baptised in water, Holy Spirit comes on him, and then the, the full revelation of him being fully God and fully human as he starts his miraculous ministry and preaching, teaching, that he goes into Nazareth, probably one of the first or second places, goes into the synagogue, the local church, just what, like a church situation, and the Jews, they all know him. And have a look at this, within hours, how a group of people can change. It says in Luke 4, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Man, isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Wow, what words of grace, we like what he's saying. In this situation but then he shares a little bit some truth that's a bit unpalatable to them they hadn't thought that way before and he sows some seeds and it really offends 
the synagogue leader and a couple of others, and they stir up the people. And have a look at this. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of a hill, which the town was built on, in order to throw him off the cliff. They wanted to kill him. A murderous impulse came upon them. Shows you the power of a thought, of an idea, of somebody who sows a lie or, or gets stirred up and can stir another two or three people and who knows what can take place. The Gospel of Mark, as I was reading it a few years ago now, I mean I read it all the time, but uh, it hit me as I was reading chapter 5 and 6 about two communities that had a heart transforming attitude. One was very positive, one was negative. The two communities were, were called Gadara and Gennesaret. They were around the, the Lake of Galilee, which is not a big lake, so the distance is probably between the Adelaide foreshore, the beach suburbs, and say the hill suburbs. So the lake's not a big lake. And they're two communities in the same region. But man, their mindsets were so different. Um, and I'd like us to read about these two contrasting heart attitudes. The first one, the Gadara community, let me give you the context. In Gadara, there was a man who was quite mad. In fact, mad and bad. And uh, we don't know what happened, but it seemed like some evil spirits, demonic powers from hell, had taken advantage of his natural weaknesses and he became energised supernaturally to do evil. And he terrorised the community. Nobody could hide it. They'd try to chain him, he'd break the chains. He used to live in the tombs, like living at the West End Cemetery, West Terrace Cemetery, just living there. And, uh, and so, uh, just terrible situation. Anyway, Jesus comes to town and the guy knew that only Jesus could heal him. And uh, local doctors couldn't, uh, his family couldn't, everyone rejected him. So he races to Jesus and as he comes to Jesus, the demons in him, the evil spirits, start talking and you know, we're going to kill him and, you know, what are you doing here, Jesus? And, and uh, you know, don't torment us because light and darkness, God appearing, this guy who's demonised gets, the demons start talking. Anyway, Jesus says, shut up, get out of him. That's what exorcism means. So when it says rebuke, it's a nice word that we use, but actually, Jesus, rebuke means shut up, stop talking and get out of him. Where are we going to go in it? Go in the pigs. So he cast them out and he go, they go into the pigs and the pigs go over the cliff because they didn't want to have the evil demons in them either. So the guy now is healed. A miracle has taken place. He's, he's restored to his wife and kids. He's a fine upstanding member of the community. Look at the response of the people at Gadara. When they came to Jesus, they saw a man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. The legion is about 5,000. So, you know, whether it was 5,000 or, a, a, or, or just kind of embellished language, um, lots of demons, lots of evil, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Get this, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. They said, please leave, and they ran him out of town. Weird. The second group, just not far, you know, 15 minutes drive, 20 minutes drive from here, just another region, get on the boat, go across, a place called Gennesaret, have a look at their attitude and tell me who we should be like, the Gadarene community or the Gennesaret community. When they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, the people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats and, and to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. Wow. Now from this story, from this story, we can see what a person who runs after Jesus looks like. Oh, I want the Christian Family Centre. That means every one of you to be runners after Jesus. And that reveals to me your hearts are transformed. Your hearts are in the right place. And so, from this story, we can see what a runner after Jesus looks like. Firstly, they recognise who Jesus really is. That's what it says. As soon as he got out of the boat, these people, they kind of recognised Jesus. 
John says in, John, in his Gospel of John, John 1.14, that when Jesus came to earth, the God-man, the eternal son, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, John says, you know what? He is the grace giver and the truth teller. Fully God, fully human, but he's come to tell us the truth. He's not going to tell us lies. He's going to tell us truth, and some of that truth might be unpalatable to hear when you're far from God or you're really hurting other people or hurting yourself, but he'll be the truth teller. And he will also be the grace giver, the one who gives love and joy and peace and power and deliverance and freedom. So he both proclaims God's words of truth and demonstrates God's life-giving power. The Gadarenes, they doubted and denied who he was. And even the miracle of the delivered man sitting in front of them, dressed in a sound mind, hugging his wife and kids, saying, I love you all, I love you all. He would have said, like, man, I was lost, but now I'm fine, I'm blind. That didn't even move them. It didn't remove the blindfolds of doubt and cynicism and fear from their minds. That's weird. The guys before them, the evidence is there. Whereas the Gennesaret's, those people who lived in, in that area, they had already made up their minds to obey the words of Jesus whenever he came to town or whenever he was in the room. He was like, they're saying, man, if he comes, I'm ready not just to listen, I'm ready to obey his words. And their hearts were sensitive to respond to his presence the right way. To them, he was both the Saviour and the Lord. And folks, he is our Saviour and he is our Lord. We can't have only half of him. So I want the Saviour part. I want his powerful promises. I, I need his presence and power to heal my body, to heal my mind, to provide financially, to meet a material need, to sort out a relationship, to help me in my time of need. The Saviour loves to do that. And he will do that for you even today. We've talked about intractable illnesses, incurable illnesses, terminal illnesses. We're believing God can heal people and he can heal some of those folks. And we're, we're believing for that first healing clinic is that the presence and power of Christ is going to heal some amazing situations. We can't guarantee it. It's Jesus who does it, but we're going to give it a go to believe and pray. So we, we know that the Saviour loves to save and heal and forgive and, and, and deliver people of evil spirits that might be driving them crazy. But he's also the Lord. He has authoritative commands that address how we are to live and how we are to behave. And some of those commands we don't like because they're in your face. Oh man, I don't mind you doing this stuff for me, Jesus, but if you're going to talk to me about how I'm living and how I handle my relationships and, and what I do at work and how I raise my kids and... Nah, Saviour's okay, but not Lord. You can, it doesn't work. He won't be your Saviour long. You'll get the benefits, but you won't actually be thoroughly blessed with new life and new empowerment unless He's also the Lord and the Master of our lives. He's our King and our Master, not just our Saviour, Healer, Deliverer, Restorer and Power. Church, do you recognise who He really is? Because for our hearts to be transformed, we've got to recognise who He really is and let Him be the Saviour and the Lord. That's what the Gennesaret people did, not the Gadarene people. Secondly, people with transformed hearts, like the Gennesarenes, wholeheartedly run after Jesus. It says that they ran throughout that whole region, carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. The Gadarenes ran Jesus out of town. They wanted him out of sight and out of mind. If I don't see him, I don't have to think about him. And I don't have to reflect on his words and his ways. You see, unbelief is not non-belief. People think, oh, if this person has unbelief, therefore they don't believe. No, no, they do believe. Unbelief is not non-belief, it's wrong belief. The Gadarenes had wrong belief in spite of the evidence. Whereas the Gennesarets, even before they had any evidence of his miraculous power, they had right belief. 
Both forms of belief lead to action. Right actions or wrong actions. And to run after Jesus, you know, I've kind of listed down here, to run after Jesus, what does it really mean? What's the bottom line? You know what it means to me? And I want you to be runners after Jesus. I want you to recognize who he is. But to run after Jesus involves constantly talking to him. That's what prayer is. Just talk to him all the time. Any anxiety, any fear, any problem, any situation, just don't try and sort it out yourself first. Just talk to him. Say, Lord, I need you. And, and just be talking to him. Tell him you love him and appreciate him and thank him. And I just so enjoyed Laura being back from holidays and leading us in worship today. I felt like I was in heaven. Didn't you? Transported. This is good, have somebody anointed to lead us. And it's beautiful, isn't it, to to worship him and to sense his presence. And I'm talking to him about a lot of things during that worship time. And I found him talking back to me. Because when you worship and you're opening your heart and you're talking to him, he will talk to you, particularly if you're reading the Bible. If you're reading a chapter a day, like following the Life Journal, he will speak to you. So we talk to him in prayer, he talks to us through his word. He can talk to us through the Holy Spirit, but the main way he talks to us is through his written word, because sometimes we might, get, we might think he's saying something to us and it's too subjective, we've got to test it with God's word. Because and, 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 if he says something to you that goes against the book, no, nah, it's not God, it's just your own mind. But the book tells us, and that's how Jesus speaks to us. Constantly talking to him in prayer. That's what it means, running after Jesus. To run after Jesus involves allowing him to talk to you through his word. To run after Jesus involves really getting connected with fellow Christ followers in his church. Believing and belonging are linked together. And this involves weekly attendance and involvement in our Sunday gatherings and our midweek connect groups. I thank you that you're here today. I'll be even more thankful if you're here next week and the week after and the other week. And you might say, but I've got a broken leg. Who cares? Come along with your broken leg and let's see if Jesus will heal it. I'm sick. I shouldn't come. No, come, get healed. I'm a bit down and depressed. I'm having difficulty. Come, he will heal the brokenhearted. If you're sick, if you're needy, if you've sinned, oh, I've sinned, I can't go. Come, Jesus is here to forgive and to restore. This is the hospital for sinners. And Bill Vasilakis is the chief of sinners. No excuses every week at church. Can I hear an amen for that? Now just take this message to all those who are not here today. (laughs) Tell them, you've got to hear this message. Because you guys, I'm sure, you, you are the regular ones. Regularly attending. And look, you cannot grow. You cannot run after Jesus properly unless you're doing life together with another group of people, between five and, say, 15 people in a small group, a connect group. You need to meet with them weekly, fortnightly, or even monthly. You need to have a group of people that you can pray with, talk with, share. Not a repeat of Sunday service, but connecting together more meaningfully because this is a big crowd. And you can't meaningfully connect with people in a large service. You can have a meal and share, but on a regular, doing life together, praying, sharing, talking, ministering, is is so important. So to run after Jesus involves constantly talking to him, prayer, allowing him to talk to you, the word, really getting connected with fellow Christ followers in his church. It also involves using your personal prayer language to build your intimacy with Jesus and to release his power in and through you. The gift of speaking in tongues is our personal hotline to God. And maybe this year, if you haven't received that gift, you ought to seek God for it. You need it. I mean, yesterday was a busy day. We had a significant event in the morning at our home, wonderful breakfast, time with with key leaders in the church. And then Kath and I are finishing kind of my preparation and she's doing some typing for me. And then we race off to a wedding of a Greek family and, and it was the biggest Greek bash you've ever seen. I mean, it was big. And then the, the reception, I thought, oh, okay, we've got to leave at 9.30. I want to be home by 10. Then I'll be in bed by 10.30, get up at 6. Beautiful. Well, they wouldn't let me go. You cannot miss Zorba. You cannot miss the Greek dancers. And, and, uh, and so, you know, 11 o'clock is there, and, and it's a wild show. It's a great Greek show. You know, my big fat Greek wedding style. And there was a fantastic band. And even the guy with the bazooki, you know that? He was really good. And I saw a 93-year-old woman get up there and start doing the thing. And it just reminded me of my dad at 96. 
at Stephanie's wedding 12 years ago. He gets up, the old boy, he's 96, and he, and he thinks he's 36, and he starts going to do And I race out, and I'm there behind him <laughs> like this. And everyone thinks, what's the matter with you? I say, he's 96. If he falls over, he's gone. You know, breaks a... So as I'm there, I'm just thinking, oh, I'm thinking of Dad, and Kathy was thinking the same. So, look, it was a great night, but I came home, and I was exhausted. And then, of course, when you're exhausted and you're overtired, you don't sleep. Well, 1.30... So I get in the car this morning to drive here. I think, I don't even feel like going to church this morning. I need another two hours sleep. But I'm committed. I'm here. And I'm the preacher. Oh, what do I need? Hey. So what do I need? I thank God for my personal hotline to heaven. I just start to use that gift of speaking in tongues. From the moment I left home, Tim was in front of me in the car. I made sure I stayed at 60. I didn't go too fast. I had a witness there. And I'm praying in the Spirit. By the time I got here, do I look tired? Do I look beaten up? No. I need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. There are situations that arise that are far more serious than what I'm half joking about now. But the use of this gift is absolutely essential. You need it. If you haven't received it, grab my little booklet in the foyer on the baptism in the spirit, the gift of tongues, and use it and read it and study it. Get someone to pray with you. Pray on your own. The Lord will do it for you. And so you need that gift. And also to run after Jesus also means that you're a constant learner who just wants to keep growing in Christ and who desires to serve Jesus' purposes. That's what a disciple is, constantly learning. Constantly. You can't grow unless you're learning. A disciple means a mathiti in the Greek. It means I'm a learner. And so, folks, that's how we run after Jesus. Will you run after Jesus this year? So, Tim's advertised Bible Discovery with Pastor Adrian. Wouldn't it be great to have 50 people doing that course? You'd have to do it twice, Tuesday and Thursday night. That would be something. Some of you need that. You need to, to understand how does the Old Testament fit together? How does the New Testament fit together? Some of you need to do new beginnings. Just four or five lessons about the basics of the Christian life. You haven't done that. You need to learn to understand what it means to be a Christian. And to understand the Old and New Testament. There are other great spiritual books you can read. Go to Kurong. They're fantastic. Amazing books. If you're uncertain about an author, ring one of the pastors here. And they'll say, yeah, that guy's okay. That one may be a bit dodgy. Don't read that one, but this one's okay. Or read all my booklets. They're fantastic. <laughs> They're all there. Just, I'm not interested in fine covers and making a zillion bucks. They're all for free. Grab them and read them and study them. And I tell you, you'll learn and you will grow. Thirdly, people who run after Jesus, they not only see who, recognize him, who he really is, they're not just people who are pursuing him, as I've said, but they selflessly reach needy people for Jesus. It says, and wherever he went into villages, towns, and or the countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. The Gadarenes were heartless about people who were suffering, as if there weren't other people who were demonized or sick or troubled kids in, in, in trauma, women who were abused and, and abandoned, as if there weren't people in need. And they see the man who's been healed and their hearts are not moved to think of other people who are suffering. They close their hearts from people who are in great need. Not so the Gennesaret people. They knew that Jesus loved people and they knew that Jesus could heal and meet people's needs. They were filled with confidence because Jesus' presence was with them and they lovingly reached out and I believe sensitively and lovingly reached out to people facing all kinds of needs. Let's be like these fabulous Gennesaret people. They were compassionate and concerned about others and not just be concerned about your own life situation. Be concerned about the needs of people all around you. Ask God to give you eyes to see and be filled with compassion and be prepared to count the cost as you move out of your comfort zone in 2016 and offer to pray for people who are in need. Talk with them about Jesus. Anyone in need. If, if you are a sensible person, if you're a loving person and you have some relationship with that person, in other words, you're not a nut, you're not an abuser, you're, you're, you're a normal, sane, rational person like me. And most of you here, all of you here, they're not going to say no. If there are persons in need, you show love to them and you're genuinely, you're not there to rip them off. People can pick up a rip-off merchant. You genuinely love them and say, look, I would love to be able to pray with you. 
offer to pray and Jesus could do some miracles. Or say, I'd love you to come and meet Jesus Christ. He's at church this Sunday. I dare you to say that. And they'll come along and say, where is he? As I get up here or Tim gets up here or Cass will say, he's inside here. He's into you. He's among us. You've got to get out of your comfort zone to reach people and to be bold. Be compassionate. Count the cost. Be courageous and bold and step out in faith because Jesus' presence is with you. I was talking to Pastor Chris. Kip. Pastor Chris, come, come forward here. I just... He's one of our lay pastors, and I mean, he runs a business, but he's, 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 a, he's, a, fully, he's a credentialed minister, a marriage celebrant, and we have stacks of them in, in the church here. The church couldn't function without them. But Chris runs a business, and he was telling me the other day that since November, in his shop at Mitcham, 16 people you've led to Christ. Are you making any money? Are you selling anything there, Chris? Or are you, are you an evangelist there? You're doing well financially, but you're, le- you're leading people to Christ. So... Chris is an evangelist, we know, he's got a a gift of an evangelism, but I tell you what, Paul says to Timothy, you can do the work of an evangelist. We all can do and learn. Chris, just share with us what's taking place there. I know you're a man of compassion, but you count the cost and you're very courageous. How do you do it there? And like, you're there to to, to make a living and you're leading people to Christ. How does, it, how does it happen? What happens in you to, to, to draw these people or they just come to you? Or, give us a story. Uh, it's an amazing uh, Just hold sto- it close, Chris. It's yeah. an amazing story, of course. It's not about me. Uh, I've got my flaws. I've got my sins. I'm a normal person. I'm flesh and blood. But one thing I know, and it says it in Mark 12, 28 to 30, it says, love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And that's the first commandment. And when I came 33 years ago to the Lord Jesus Christ, I, kind of, I found out the life. I found what life is all about. And when Jesus touched my heart, all those attributes that were there, they came and connected with my heart. See, to love God, you, need, you require to spend time with him. It's like a relationship. It's like a friendship. If you don't have the relationship with Jesus, you've got to lay the foundation. You've got to talk to Jesus like he's a friend. You've got to talk to him like he's your best mate. And you've got to tell him everything that you feel within your heart. That's good. And I'll yeah. tell you what, God, Jesus listens. As you're going to hear what I'm going to share, it's an amazing story. It's not about me. It's all about my Lord Jesus Christ. And if God can do that to me, he can do it to every one of us here to, uh, uh, today. Just hold it closer, Chris. So, um, um, so um, it's amazing that when that happens and you have spent time with the Lord Jesus Christ, automatically the first thing that happens, what is it? is that you put God number one in your life. And I tell you, always from the day that I came to the Lord, Jesus is number one in my life. Even when I'm down a lot of times, even when I feel like, oh, you know, ill or whatever, never take that spot. No one will take it. Even my wife wouldn't even take that spot, and I love her so much. Jesus is the main reason that I'm alive. Jesus gave me hope. Jesus gave me insurance. He gave me salvation. He gave me eternity. How can I put Jesus anywhere else but number one? And when you put Jesus number one, everything else in your life is blessed. Everything else, everything else, your business, everything. So, Jesus says in uh, Mark 6.21, he says, wherever your treasure is, there you, your heart will be too. So, I have my treasure in my Lord Jesus Christ. My treasure and my heart is with Jesus Christ. Now, what you said to me, Bill, I don't have to do nothing. I open my business. Before I go to uh, open my business, I do a prayer. And I say, Lord, your servant is here to serve you. <laughs> I am willing. Don't worry about the business because I know God's going to protect me in that area too. I want people to be saved. Jesus said in his word, he says, he hates the death of a sinner. Automatically, if I have the attributes and I have the heart of Jesus, automatically what do I do? I hate someone dying without me speaking to him about the Lord Jesus Christ. So I get a lot of people passing my shop, 88 years old, 50 years old, 30 years old. And my prayer is, Lord, bring someone, bring someone. The end of November till December, uh, January the 29th, 16 people came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? You can't get a better joy than that. Yeah. To me, that is, no money can fulfill that. No, no, nothing. 
Jesus said, there's a soul I'm going to meet in heaven one day. There's another soul. Then I said, and I'm not talking previously or how many souls came to the Lord. And again, it's not a prideful thing. It's giving glory to my Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? I sit back sometimes and I say, Lord, I'm sitting in a shop. I said, 7.5 billion people. And you look at this shop and there's one servant there. And you bring in souls. And I, you know how fantastic I feel that God can see me, that God can send people? You know what? It's not a hard task. I have no fear. I'm not shy. Years back when I first came to the Lord, I grabbed everyone. I brought them. I said, from hell into heaven. <laughs> not many people came. Now, <laughs> not many people came. Now, I wait. And I say, Lord, you bring them. I'm willing. Yeah, it's good. And Very he good. brings them wonderfully. And I give you an, uh, an understanding. And the other part of that, Mark 12, 28, 30 is, that he says, the second commandment, he says, to love your neighbor as yourself. And there is none other greater uh, commandment than this. And you know what? If I love Jesus, what's the next thing I have to do? To share the good news. Yeah. Go and proclaim the good news to the whole world. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let me give you some examples. I won't go to 16 of them, Bill. I'll say about two or three. I'm waiting there. A lady comes in, a European background, which I knew for a while. She comes with a servant, a, 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 per, a carer. She comes and says, Chris says, I don't know what happened. I'm moving from my house and I'm going to a home. So I'm burning all my religious pictures. Wow, I said, God, what's this? So she brings me this photo of Jesus Christ. He says, I put methyl on it. And suddenly he says, he burned the, uh, the color of it. But look at the picture, he says. Nothing has been touched. I said, Lord, I said, thank you. <laughs> There's the opportunity. So I said, oh, is that what happened? Now, let me tell you the story, why this happened. And after five minutes, the carer, of course, and the lady were holding hands, and they're doing the sinner's prayers, and they give the heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is one story. That's good. That's one story. Now, what happens? I got a uh, New Year's Eve. I got bladder infection. And 2016 was very bad for me for 25 days. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I said, started bad, I said, Lord, and God says to me, my ways are not your ways. And I'm not going to argue with that. I'm going to say, Lord, you win on that. But I said, Lord, I went back to work. I had cold sores everywhere. Normally, I look after myself. I don't want to talk to anyone. I feel shy a little bit if I look good. And, uh, <laughs> and then the lady comes there, and she goes to me. She starts talking from Ecuador, Maria, in about 10 minutes. I said, Lord, I said, thank you. She gives her heart to the Lord. I'm doing a coffee in the morning, Greek coffee in the morning always, and I hear footsteps in the shop, and I've got a store room, and I said, oh, Lord, I said, not now, not 9.30. Let me enjoy my coffee. Let me just enjoy myself. And anyway, I come out. There's this lady by the name of Denise. Now, Denise is the newspaper, messenger, Facebook, YouTube. You do something wrong to this lady, everybody else knows. <laughs> so I was always careful for 15 years not to say nothing to her. She comes there. Oh, I said, oh, Denise. Oh. Anyway, how God works in strange ways, right? We're sitting there. I said, Denise, I haven't seen you for a while. He says, oh, Chris says. That's why I say there's so many hurtful people out there. They're going through struggles. You don't know. You look at the outside and you say, oh, everything's going well. And she goes, I said, what's wrong, Denise? He says, uh, you know, Chris says, I'm in depression. I've got issues here, issues there, and I want to take my life. Lord, I said, thank you so much. And I started preaching the word of God, sharing the God, good news to her. After five minutes, this Denise that you couldn't even open that, your mouth to say anything, she's crying, she's holding my hands, and she's doing the sinner's prayer. Yeah, that's great. You know, so mm -hmm. listen, there's nothing special about me. The only special about me is I love my Lord Jesus Christ, and I have a willing heart to serve him. Don't look at yourself and say, I'm not good enough, I'm not going to be like Christian. Of course you're not going to be like me. I'm Greek, I'm a different person, but you got your own personality. <laughs> you got your own your own attributes. You can do what God That's already good. has planned yeah. to you, but yeah. God says, step out. Yeah. Step out. Yeah. Step out from your faith. Step in your faith. Okay. And I tell you, there's a lot of souls to be saved. Yeah. There's a lot of souls to be saved. So I'm, I'm encouraging you. Don't take a step backward, but take a step forward yeah. and see what God can do in Wonderful. your life. He's a true Gennesaret man, isn't he? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> folks, just a little bit of compassion. Prepare to count the cost and be courageous and boldly step out. Some of you are saying, Chris, pray for me. 
you may not, you're not him, but God's speaking to you that you can do it at school, you can do it at university, you can do it in your neighbourhood. As we come to a conclusion in a few moments, if you want prayer, over here, we're going to have Chris and others pray for you, just for impartation. And uh, you may not be an evangelist, a gift of an evangelist, but you can all do the work of evangelism. 2016, heart transformation has to do with recognising who Jesus is, wholeheartedly running after him, selflessly reaching needy people for Jesus. And you know the final thing with these Gennesaret people is they expected to receive miracles from Jesus. And... um, uh, it says that. It says, they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak and all who touched him were healed. The Gadarenes stepped back in fear and unbelief, whereas the Gennesaret people stepped forward with expectant faith. One group closed their hearts, whereas the others opened their hearts wide. And, and you can feel the Gennesaret people, their strong desire and their persistence. They just anticipated supernatural results. They begged him, it says. What an example for us to beg him to reach out to him, lay hands on people. I was noticing Steve in Alice Springs before the service started. This is Rebecca's father-in-law. Beautiful indigenous people and white people. As, as anyone that's sick, he's talking to them and you just see him. Before the first song, he's just laying hands, just gently praying for them. You can do that wherever you are. People who are needy because that's the hand of Jesus. Anointing with oil, we do this and we can anoint you with oil this morning. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's releasing your faith in a point of contact, the biblical point of contact, which is, okay, the oil speaks of the Holy Spirit. Hands speak of the hand of Jesus. Step out. Be prayed for. Say, I would like to lead someone to Christ this year. You could. God could use you. I'd like to pray for you that God could use you to speak to one person to lead them to Jesus Christ. Yes, you. But you you have to... You'll, be, you'll challenge you to get out of your comfort zone. You have to count the cost. And, uh, and I tell you, if you're a loving person, you've got a relationship with people, most people will let you pray for them. In fact, most people don't come to church because someone doesn't ask them. You just may be surprised and say, if you ask somebody, they might just say yes, particularly if they know you, you're a credible person. And so, step out and uh, ask for prayer, believing as you act. And give thanks to God with the expectation that Jesus can touch you. You might need healing today. Don't just wait for the healing clinic. You might need healing. Jesus does the healing. He can heal you where you're seated. You can come out the front. We can pray for you. The prayer of faith looks like this. It looks like where a person is praying and talking to God and expecting him to answer and anticipating results and thanking him in advance for the answers even before they see it. That's the Gennesaret people. They just went out and got people with the expectation that Jesus would do something. The Gadarene people had the guy who was miraculously healed and they just closed off and said, nah, no more. We want to be Gennesaret people. Hearts that are transformed. Hey? And let's infect one another with this kind of attitude. Let's have some good positive group think on this one, hey? And, and, and to be stirred in, in, in having our hearts transform and change the climate of our hearts and will change the climate of our church and will change the climate of our community. Can you say amen?